So when Newcom asked me to interview you, I was really excited because um, there are a couple of um, concepts that you've developed that I find particularly thrilling. And so I was hoping maybe we could start by going back to your concept of cargo. Um, I personally, in my own professional experience, have watched rather mediocre DARVO responses uh, persuade DAs, police officers, and medical providers to not provide appropriate responses. So I was wondering if you could kind of expand more on um, what your concept of DARVO is, how we can really apply uh, that knowledge to our interventions, and maybe watch the South Park clip, because um, that's actually how I first learned about DARVO, and it was a moment where I popped off my couch and experiences I had in, in um, thinking about Dharma as a, as a coherent thing. And it, it wasn't the only experience. In fact, I had, I had been the recipient of Dharma responses myself, but it really came together for me watching Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings. Because I was so surprised <coughs> Clarence Thomas had been head of the EEOC. And I'm sitting there going, wait a minute, the head of the EEOC would understand how important it is to have space to talk about sexual harassment and how difficult it is for somebody to come forward. So I tried to put myself into the position of the head of the EEOC and feel that I was actually innocent. And what a difficult position to be in. And I, I was thinking, then what I would say is some version of, oh my god, I'm mortified and horrified and I, I don't think I did these things. It doesn't connect with what I remember about what was going on. But you know, here's this here's my respected colleague saying this happened. We need to figure this out. One thing I do know from having been in this in this position is how important this is. How important it is we have the opportunity to discuss this openly and get to the bottom of this. That's how I feel like it, the response should have been. But Anita Hill got viciously attacked, viciously, by lots of people, including um, Clarence Thomas and senators and the media and so on. And the attack did take just the form of Dargo. I mean, first of all, there was a total denial about what she was saying, but then her credibility was attacked over and over. And then, um, you know, Clarence Thomas totally put himself in the victim role, and that was accentuated by everybody else. So Anita um, Hill became the perpetrator. So I, I, you know, unfortunately, we keep seeing this happen, and we've seen a lot of it in the last couple of years. Um, and I believe that um, Trump is one of the main reasons it's so popular right now, because he's really, really good at it. And it works for him. Um, his responses to every single allegation of sexual misconduct have been Darvo responses. But it, it's not just there, it's everything he does. And when you see somebody so powerful use it to their effect, it's no surprise other people start to use it. I mean, it's been used before Trump, of course, but it just seems to be really going on right now. It was really in full force during the Kavanaugh hearings. And I, I remember sitting in the seminar room with a group of colleagues. I was at the Center for Advanced Study of Behavioral Sciences, a multidisciplinary place up at the Stanford Hills, and we were all watching the, the hearings together. And, and I, people were familiar with my concept by then. And as, uh, uh, like moments before, I said, oh my god, he's going to say blah. And it was like, I, I felt like a sports commentator. You know? <laughs> this is what he's going to do, and he did. And, and again, I think it was very effective. I'm not saying every time somebody darvas, they're guilty, because people can respond defensively and horribly even if they did do something, or if they didn't do something. It's what I am saying is it's a harmful response, and um, it, it does damage in the here and now. No matter what happened in the past, darvo does damage in the here and now. And so I think it's really important that we figure out how to stop it um, so we don't have additional damage. So as a follow-up, um, knowing kind of 
understanding DARPA responses and how effective they are, are there ways that a university or an institution might incorporate that knowledge into their response systems, either the Title IX student conduct hearings, the um, reporting for our legal system, or our police department here? Yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing, it's not the only thing, but one thing is to educate people about sort of helpful responses and unhelpful responses, and to give people tools for when they're accused of something, and they either feel they didn't do it, or they're unwilling to own it. Other things they can say, well, I mean, the best thing is to own it, but other things they can say that are not conversation stoppers and don't add, like, insult to injury. So through education, but then, you know, I have Mary Cox is going to talk in the next session, because obviously, um, when you get to the point of adjudication, giving people options that don't Sort of clear for a response. I mean, clearly, the defense attorneys, when they're defending as rape cases, kind of are put in a position where it's logical they don't know. That is the nature of, of rape defense, right? You you attack the credit, you say it didn't happen, you attack the credibility of the victim and witnesses, and then you put your, your person you're defending in the victim role. So, there's the whole judicial system is calling for it. So having an alternative adjudication processes probably is one important thing as well. Um, on the note of needing to provide additional education and research these issues more, would you like to speak a little bit about the Center for Institutional Courage and the work that um, that nonprofit's doing that you've recently yeah. established? Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what I get up every morning. What they do. Um, so, I mean, among the research topics, we will, as I mentioned, the, the vision for the center is to be half research and half outreach. And among the research topics that will be clearly very central will be to really delve deeply into, into Dargo and related concepts. So, um, I, I mentioned that it's clear apology is very powerful as a healing um, element, but only apologies. Only some apologies. Apology, getting apologies right is pretty tricky, and insincere apologies can be worse than no apology at all. Um, and it often isn't enough to just give one apology for really major transgressions. There may be multiple apologies necessary. So really getting a handle on apology will be really important, and there's just insufficient research. When you look up what's not about apology, you get a lot of people who've written books and manuals based on their wisdom, and there's some great insights there, but there's remarkably little empirical work on apology. And apology's like the counter, to the, the real counter to Dargo. I mean, the, the, the thing I said, how, like, what you would say if you feel you're innocent, um, that, that's a kind of counter to Dargo if you feel you're innocent. But, you know, most people that get accused of something have done it. So really, really the counter is to acknowledge and apologize and um, to figure out how we can create a society where um, that is a viable alternative for people. I mean, I think there are many reasons people are afraid to do that. Um, at least one of them is, is our, our responsibility as a society that we don't necessarily give the people a space in which it's safe for them to apologize. And again, I think this relates to restorative justice and, and approaches to other ways of letting things get healed. Um, but, you know, my hint of my sense about DARVO is, first of all, to understand how much of it's getting people are learning and how they're learning it, um, and then to figure out ways to counter it through education. Um, probably starting pretty young. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, a great research agenda there. I have honestly lost some amount of hope that it's just going to happen in universities without something like the Center for Institutional Courage to be really focused driving, driving this kind of work. Um, I'm hoping that there's going to be a lot of university collaborations, but I think there needs to be a, a central hub um, because it's hard to get institutions to study the misbehavior of institutions. That's <laughs> really hard. So, um, thinking about the way institutions function and how they're, uh, what's required to have them change. Um, 
So policies, procedures surrounding sexual violence at universities are typically determined at a system level by people who aren't necessarily experts in sexual violence. I'm thinking general counsel, um, senior level, higher administration, et cetera. Um, needing kind of faculty and staff to execute policies like mandatory reporting um, and things like that that they necessarily did not have a say in developing nor would they necessarily um, do if they, if they had a choice. So what can individuals within an institution do to kind of exact the institutional courage that's required to start pushing an institution towards that direction, acknowledging that um, we are within a kind of a larger body? Yeah, you touched on so many important things there. I mean, I just want to go back to sort of the setup you were giving. I mean, one thing we do see right now in universities and in the private sector is policies being driven by legal counsel. I think that's a problem right there. Um, legal counsel has an important duty in, in institutions, but it's not to drive leadership decisions. Make the decisions, then go to legal and say, how are you going to help us bring this to fruition? You start with legal, and they're going to take you into the most risk management compliance approach. Um, so one thing is this problem, and I don't know how much faculty can change it, but they can, they can raise it as an issue. Well, if I've been collecting examples of institutional courage, and they almost always involve people doing things despite what they're being told by legal counsel, because that's what leaders have to do. Because in fact, always, leaders need to be willing to take calculated risks. And if you stop taking risks, you're driving yourself down into a hole. Um, faculty increasingly feel disempowered in universities. This has changed over the course of my career. I was, my first academic job was in 1983, and um, I've seen faculty become more and more demoralized, go from seeing themselves as the people that run universities to the, to the employees, to you know, now feeling like there's management and so on. And it's an unfortunate trend in higher education. But to some extent, powerlessness in this situation is part of the responsibility of faculty too, because you only have the power to claim. And when faculty shrug their shoulders and say, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. It's all being done by administration. Why, what can I do? That's exacticated. So uh, some of the examples of institutional courage I've seen are when faculty or even employees don't take it that approach. There, UBC, a group of faculty, wrote a letter of apology on behalf of the university for their mistreatment of a sexual harassment case. Hunter faculty got together and wrote the letter. They said, we're the University of British Columbia. Why not? Why, why aren't they any less than anyone else? And they wrote an apology letter. What a remarkably wonderful thing to do, because the apology letter really meant a whole lot, not only to the victim, but to the whole community. So that was just a letter. So there, I think there are always things that can be done. The one thing I always caution, though, is there is retaliation out there, and it will happen when you try to change the system. It just does. So the, the, first of all, people need to know that. Um, and they need to be smart about it. And one of the best ways to be smart about it is solidarity. So notice I said it wasn't one professor who wrote a letter. It was 100 professors who together signed a letter. Solidarity there is the protection. It's much harder to retaliate against 100 people. I mean, maybe if there are 100 Chinese faculty member members, but we're in the United States of America, and we haven't gotten yet to that point. So I do think we can take much more power than we can And could you go back and talk a little bit more about mandatory reporting and your view of how that works when we're thinking about institutional betrayal or institutional courage. Yeah. So when I first, so I, I said I've been researching sexual violence for a long time, but my focus primarily in terms of college students was, was uh, because I'm a faculty member, I can research with college students, was um, using college students to understand the impact of childhood sexual abuse. And one of the impacts of childhood sexual abuse is um, college student victimization because there's a huge re-victimization thing going on. And so I, I had been studying the, uh, the, the rates, to some extent, of sexual victimization in college students as a consequence of this upset. So I was really aware of a lot of what was going on. And 
without thinking I was studying it quite the way I ended up thinking about it. And one of the things that would come up over and over again when I would begin to talk about the impact on college students early on was this issue of mandatory reporting, and people would be asking me all the time. And it was, it was interesting because at the time at the University of Oregon, there really wasn't a coherent policy at all. And um, to the extent there was any policy, it was buried in some other, in a footnote of some other random policy. It, it was really a mess. Um, but, but somebody somewhere in there pointed out to the university that they were not in compliance. It was believed with the Dear Colleague letter of 2011 and so on, and they scrambled to try to address it and made a draconian mandatory reporting policy like so many universities in this country that basically says, um, it turns faculty and staff into snitches or something. Well, if a student comes and talks to you, you have to turn the information over. And just on the face of it, to me, this is disaster waiting to happen for so many reasons. First of all, what is the, what is the um, nature of sexual victimization, whether it's verbal harassment or um, penetration? It involves some form of taking somebody's agency away from them. <coughs> You're intruding on their agency. And that's why we think it's important to teach consent, right? So that people understand that you have bodily autonomy and, and, and other kinds of rights as a, of agency and that you need to respect it. So what happens when you take somebody who's just been wounded and you wound them in exactly the same spot again? And you say, oh, you didn't want that other student to you know, fondle you or insert his penis into you or make such jokes to you? You didn't want that? Well, we're going to take that information and do what we want with it, whether you like it or not. It just on the face of it doesn't make sense to me. And in fact, social science research shows that one of the most <coughs> social responses that you can do to a person is take away control over their story. Research by Sarah Ullman and others have actually investigated what hurts people when they make a social disclosure? <coughs> what responses are hurtful? Well, of course, invalidating and blaming is hurtful. Taking control away often is at the top of the list, over invalidating. So again, we know from social science research not to do it. Um, what I found when I, I tried to address this in my own university and more generally is that resistance was there. And people would say, oh, we need the mandatory reporting because without it, how are we going to find out who the perpetrators are? And how are we going to, whatever, whatever. So first of all, like 6% of sexually harassed students report, maybe 10% of undergraduates report. You think this is a good way to track perpetrators? Alternatives, and we can implement them. They're good alternatives. Um, so to kind of change, change lanes, uh, you've described institutional betrayal as being gender specific and have implicated, I think, rather accurately, institutions participating in betrayal is also participating in a form of sexism. Um, could you first describe your argument about the gendered nature of institutional betrayal, which you did touch on earlier? Um, and, and second, could you talk about how institutional betrayal functions in a gendered way and how universities can best provide that culturally responsive um, intervention in the current climate that we're in with the DOE that is hypersensitive to this idea that men are being disproportionately affected by Title IX and um, policies and universities that are equally hyper concerned that they are going to be implicated by the DOE and that. That's a lot. It is. So <laughs> could you, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to one thing, which is, uh, on all the research where we see gender effects um, and whether it's sexual victimization rates or institutional betrayal exposure rates, um, these are probabilistic relationships. And I don't want to say ever, like, only women have something and men never do. In fact, like, if you look at um, exposure overall from life course to betrayal trauma, we see, you know, a huge effect size that women are more at risk. But we also see really high rates of victimization among men, too. So, um, and similarly with the traumas that are not high betrayal. We see high, much higher risk for men, but women get exposed to these at a lot higher rates too. So these are probabilistic. In the case with, with institutional betrayal, I want to also add, and this is true with sexual assault, 
I just talked about gender because I have a really short amount of time, but, um, but it's, it's really about social inequality. So all of the dimensions associated with demographic variables like race and ethnicity and sexual orientation and age, these are all also risk factors for these things. And just as one example, when we look at institutional betrayal risk among students, um, we see a, a, a really heightened risk for um, female-identified um, but not straight students. And they're just at like enormously high risk. So women who are not straight for institutional betrayal. Um, so so I, I think it's important to just keep in mind this is a, it's about, uh, it's really part of a system of um, power and, and oppression. And institutional betrayal reflects people's, you know, if you have less power, you're more at risk, but it also maintains and, and replicates the power structure. It keeps people in a down position if they get betrayed by the institution. So going back to what Sally said, I mean, dismantling this is really getting at the roots, ultimately, of these forms of oppression and and educating people and raising children, not to be misogynist and racist and, and all those things, um, which is a kind of big project. But <laughs> but I think it's with my public we could do it. We you know, put the capital into it. And again, I would say we could start with our institutions and fixing our institutions. Now, I just totally forgot what the second part of the question is. So considering if we know that uh, female-identified individuals are at higher, a higher risk, yeah. and then we know that um, intersecting identities can also compact that. Yeah. Is there a way that an institution, or have you discovered institutions that have found some kind of specifically culturally responsive intervention to to apply institutional courage yeah. um, in the face of institutional betrayal? Um, I don't think I have a single answer to that. I mean, the steps that I outlined I think would move us in that direction. Um, you know, when people are, when people really embrace what I would call cultural humility, understanding, um, understanding these inequalities and the power they have, how <coughs> insidious they are, how we're all part of it, um, coming from a, a, a place of humility there and, and openness to learning has got to, has got to help on all these things. So I think we've reached the portion of our time where we can open it up to questions from the audience. Oh yes, maybe while we're, um, we can start uh, the South Park clip, is it possible to show that? We'll see. The we'll see. see. We'll see. see. If, if we click, if we get to my slide and just click on this. We'll see. And so well, maybe yeah, Laura's yeah. doing that, we could take the first question. <laughs> Dr. Zell. So, uh, I remember when I was coming up for tenure, and, my, and I was uh, talking to my therapist about how irrational I thought the university was by spending all this money to bring me there only to throw me away. And my therapist had said, it's really important that you not anthropomorphize the university, right? And that really stuck with me. But what I think was a real epiphany for me in your talk was your addition of this attachment theory component of that. So uh, sort of saying, you know, getting attached to the university and all that, I was really focusing on kind of rationality piece as opposed to the betrayal piece, which really makes a lot of sense to me. So I wonder if you have any advice as someone, as a survivor, of in addition to the solidarity of what things have been most helpful to you when you're actually in the throes of institutional betrayal. Yeah, and I have experienced a lot of institutional betrayal because I kind of put myself out there. Um, and, and I've been retaliated against numerous times. Um, right now I'm in, in the midst of a lawsuit with the university regarding very long-standing pay and equity and it's actually in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and it's hard to believe, I mean, it's hard to describe how much the legal system um, makes it very easy for legal retaliation, I guess you could say. And um, it, it, it's very painful. It is. I mean, I've, I've been at that university for over 30 years, 
And no matter how much I can think this through, how intellectually I get it, I cannot turn off my human response. And I don't want to turn off my human response. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing to be human. And, and being able to love is one of our greatest qualities. And that we can extend that love to, to snakes and whatever. It's not a bad thing. It's just it's who we are. So I, I guess what I do is I, I try to talk to myself about it and, and, be, self, and be compassionate. Like, well, of course I'm hurt. You know, I have, I have, I have feelings. Um, and through that, I, I often can get to a place where people say, oh, don't, you know the phrase that bugs me a lot, but I, I think it's worth unpacking, is when people say, don't take it personally. <laughs> and it can be the most invalidating thing to say to somebody. Well, of course it's personal, and of course you take it personally. If you're passionate about something, if you care, <coughs> if you put effort into something, of course it's personal. And when I get mistreated by my university or my government or whatever, of course I don't take it personally. But, but I guess there can be another <coughs> layer on top of it to say, well, you know, actually this institution is a constellation of a lot of people, a lot of history, a lot of momentum, written down policies, not written down behavior, uh, practices, and that some of those things are good and some of those things are bad. And there's some people at my institution who do love me. And there's some people who really don't. If it's worse than don't. And then there's a lot of people who just are apathetic. And just sort of understand it that way, like reconceptualize it, um, kind of diffuse some of this. I would not say I ever don't take it personally. But I can get to the point that I understand it's really not fundamentally about me. It's about what I represent to them. And they don't actually know the real me. They know this person who's, you know, seemingly willing to talk about these things nobody wants to hear about. But, yeah, it, it's a lot of work. So, can you show I had a question about that, actually, kind of along the same lines. Because we were talking about this, the sneak relationship. Um, I work in government, so and it feels like when you're talking about institutions, a lot of times you're the underlying institutions are private universities or companies, but I don't know if we really love the government in the same way. Maybe we do, I don't know. But, um, but so this idea that with the, your relationship with the snake, that you are working on trying to change the snake to sort of be able to, to be more personable towards you. And I think what you just touched on that I, I think about a lot is because we have these expectations of the government that aren't really realistic because, and again, to be sort of cynical, but it's built on a patriarchal oppressive system. So we have these expectations of justice that aren't there to begin with because that's not the <coughs> for government. And I wonder, like, I, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with survivors about how can we change the expectations around our institutions. Um, so not that... So I appreciate that you just said that because it is sort of in our nature to love institutions or to expect things from them. But um, instead of see, knowing that you're going to get your love back from the snake, where else can you find that affection? I think is sort of like along the lines of conversations that I've had a lot with survivors. Yeah. And I wonder if that's something that because it's sort of a two-way street. You know, how else can we can we think about how else to work with these institutions yeah. as a community hub? Yeah, so I, I sort of have two part answer to that. One is I don't stop. I don't think we should stop um, trying to change our institutions to make them better. I think that's the core of this very important, um, and they can get better. And in fact, out there in the world, we see a huge range of institutions that betray more or less, or that have more or less courage. Um, so we can move the needle there. And so the, I think it's great to have the aspiration of an institution that will protect us and won't hurt us. At the same time, holding realistic expectations in <coughs> dealing with an institution in the here and now. Um, so, in the you know, we have good reason to believe in the judicial system. If somebody goes into it and they have expectations that are not realistic, they're much more at risk of getting hurt. Um, but people can be educated and be and get some protection from from more realistic um, expectations. Um, you know, I'm not going to change snake. But I might be able to change institutions in, in, a, in a little way, as I said. 
Um, but for people who, you know, who are looking for that nurturance and positive outcome, and, and we're saying on the one hand, um, you really may not get it from the government or the courts or whatever it is, then I think the other part of your question is, well, where should they turn? And you know, my sense is that the answer there is that they have to be trusting relationships. And, it, and ultimately, that's really in a personal one-on-one. -on -one. It's hard to get those things back by force, even. Um, it's really, you know, people, people need to um, find people that they can trust. I wrote a book in, in um, about seven years ago called Life Betrayal, and it, this is kind of the issue we took up in the last chapter, is how to recognize those relationships that are giving you that nurturance that you need. Um, and there, there are some tools to, to look into, to assess those current relationships and make realistic um, assessments of whether they are um, safe nurturing relationships. So again, I think this is a place where we can educate people a lot better on how to identify positive and negative relationships in their life. So we have about two minutes left, and if we can either play the clip or... I would love to share Yeah, that. I think, I think <laughs> this is worth, uh, <coughs> worth uh, our last few minutes. Oh, oh, no. oh, oh, you just hit the clip the mic. Oh, no, oh, I'll say oh. X. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. That's going to be really loud. I think volume itself is still on still 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 low. Yeah, thank you.